Welcome to the show, FRA, which used to be Andy's company. With Still kind of is, yeah. Andy and Dudley. It was we, different, though. We did some t-shirts. You guys did some t-shirts? That was it. Yeah. We did <laughs> right. some t-shirts. We went on a bear hunt. We did go on a bear hunt. We didn't have a podcast, though. No, there was really nothing. That's where we bring people in like you. Drank a lot. For the, you're the idea guy. <laughs> I have a few ideas kicking around <laughs> up here. Every now and again, they they float out. Yep. Dude, where where have you guys been? Like, cause we've been, we were in Whitefish. Mm-hmm. What was that, last month? No, two months ago. In yeah, December. six weeks. It was, yeah. It was in December, right? I don't know, to be honest with you. We it were in Whitefish. In December. Yeah. In December. I have been in Whitefish. I haven't left. I've just been yeah. at the house. It's right. still... I would like to think we're coming out of the COVID era, but I don't think that we are. So I've just been doing my thing where I live. I haven't gone anywhere, really. But you would think because President Trump is no longer the president. So, Depending on who you ask. Right. Uh, but you would think that COVID should be over now, right? Because I mean, that, that was the whole purpose. Oh, like, isn't that interesting <laughs> how, like, is it interesting now in all these cities are like, oh, wait, we can, we can uh, you know, we, well, we don't school, have to have the lockdowns schools. anymore. They're back in session. Yeah, schools are back in session. And now... Not the, everywhere. I mean, let's be... places. Let's be a touch more fair. Some okay. places that were a Please. dumpster fire are absolutely still a dumpster fire. I'm reading in the news, the Chicago teachers, are, uh, the teachers union is not going back to school. So I think it depends on where you are and the leadership that you have. Right. And I think if you look back, or when we look back, hopefully at a good distance from this, it'll be an interesting study of good leadership and bad leadership. Oh just, my gosh. Just this get, is just this get, is like we are living in Cuomo's book. You'll find out what good leadership is, right? Yeah. yeah leadership in a time yeah. of crisis. Five years in the rearview mirror, people Everybody. will look at this and they'll look at the economic difference. I bet you in places like California and they can look at things like the suicide rate, unemployment, uh, just the general economic impact. We need some more time to truly understand, I think, what's going on. But it, I mean, yeah. people are going to look back and go, holy Just the population shit. diaspora. Like, Gavin Newsom is probably responsible for more people leaving California than in modern history. But when you have such quality leadership, like oh, yeah. Gavin Newsom, for instance, why wouldn't you want to stay? You know, when you look at the guy, you don't, think, you don't think used car salesman, dickhead. You know what you think? You think that guy's a stand-up guy? He should you know, be president. I want to drop my wife off at his house and just let her, you know, stay the night. You don't think with that slicked back douchebag haircut and his stupid shiny white teeth? You don't think this guy's just a crooked piece of shit? You never think that. You know what I mean? You think what a stand-up guy? You know, I I, I still even. There's a chance he might get reelected. That's the thing is, regardless of how you feel about him, there's a majority population in California. I'm from California, born and raised. Same. Yeah. Um, wow, you fucking assholes. Both of us. Yeah. Well. You're surrounded. People look at California and they think only Newsom. They don't realize that the disparity between blue and red in that state, it's actually drastic. Yeah. There's some very, well, not the areas that are blue are large geographically, but they're also the population centers. And those control the voting in the state and therefore right. who's going to be in office. And almost everybody else, the farther you get away from the ocean, it starts turning a little bit more red than blue, the farther away that you get. And interesting. Yeah. They're, they're actually, the vast majority from a geographical perspective in California is red, not blue. There's just San Francisco, the Bay Area, San Diego, Los Angeles County, and that basically controls uh, most of the voting in the state. Do you think it has something to do with the salt water? Because on the East Coast and the West Coast, they're both pretty blue. So do you think it has something to do with the salt? Maybe it just well, then puts people into a, a more progressive Colorado? frame of mind. I think there's a lot of people that move from the coast to Colorado. I don't know. They I brought their saltiness there? Maybe. I, to be honest with you, I, I don't give a shit if like people are conservative or liberal, either one. Like, obviously, right? I, I mean... I, I've, I've taken my fucking hits for for uh, for sides. Tulsi, you know, <laughs> and but I don't give a shit. You yeah. know, at the end of the day, it's like her podcast with Joe that she was just recently mm-hmm. on. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. I loved it. I yeah. wish that more politicians behaved like that. Who oh had gosh a thought process like that? Who were articulate like that? Who could talk about issues? Just who could sit articulate. down? It was unbelievable, and of course. 
she's no longer in politics currently. I mean, who knows what the future will hold, but the person acting like that is no longer because she was running for president, missed the opportunity to be again, <laughs> representing right. Hawaii. The person, people like that, that we need are no longer in those seats. Because they, I, I think the, I was texting her uh, that morning and, uh, and I was like, Hey, that's a great podcast. Cause I, I listened to it. It was fantastic. Know. It was a great podcast. And yeah, just the way that she represents one, the veteran community, I think is fucking incredible. Uh, because she holds people accountable. She holds people from her own party accountable for their dumbass uh, decisions, which I think is, it's something that the party bucks against, right? The, the, whether you're blue or red, if you go against the party in any way, shape or form, the party will dump trunk you. And that's what we saw. So when she holds people accountable, uh, in, of course, you're not going to agree with everything that everybody does. I, I, Dan is a fucking awesome guy. I mean, Dan Crenshaw is an awesome guy. I don't agree with everything that he talks about, but doesn't mean that I don't respect him or what he, how he thinks and moves through a logical process and how he's representing his community. More importantly, there are a lot of different veterans out there that I really wish they would go into politics because the country is void of real leadership. And I think military service, we get a, a one, it's one of the last places that really emphasizes leadership as a skill. Yeah. It's one of the last places. What's taught as a skill. Exactly. Yeah. And- but there are also, I'm going to add, there's also a lot of veterans that I don't want to go into politics. I, I, I completely agree. <laughs> I, I just think that statistically, yeah. statistically, it's one of the last places where one, we're teaching leadership and management, accountability. Uh, and we have a really good look at well, and it's who is a good leader. And it's basically a meritocracy, right? Like yeah. based on merits, you will advance as Correct. opposed to sit there and breathe. Mm. Basically. Mm. <laughs> More so than a lot of corporate environments. It's, it, it, it is framed as a meritocracy. I'm going to say that the advancement system is slightly broken. Yeah. As all, as are all, I think, ladders, whether it's in the civilian world or the military world, for the, for the most part, it does a great job. But there are some people who slide through because the system isn't perfect. Of course. Well, I think it's true in, in every, as you mentioned, corporate bureaucratic entities, right? Yeah, they're imperfect systems. They are. Uh, I think if we, if we took the special operations community, it's more of a meritocracy than... I would say the conventional military for sure. Yes. Because you'll get, you'll get fired. Like you'll get bounced. So there's a lot of places I think in the military where you just can't get fired. And we saw those people, right? It's like, they really didn't have to do shit. <laughs> I was just kind of had to show up. I, I was talking with somebody about this. I think yesterday, the military recruiting numbers are not what they once were at the apex. Right. So there is the opportunity now for them to have holes in manning and therefore tolerate things that potentially we would not have tolerated in those times where we had an excess right. of applicants. So it's uh it's a it's an ebb and flow yeah. of uh how well the community can hold special operations community what I think they do a great job of is holding themselves accountable. Mm -hmm. In the SEAL community, though I would say, well, in my opinion, one thing that they struggle with oftentimes is dealing with things immediately. They will kick the can down the road. Sometimes, and then it'll come back to bite you in the ass. I think that's human behavior. I see it all the time here where people will identify a problem. They want to address it immediately. They'll punt on it because one, or confrontation is difficult, or right? Or they'll spike it like an idiot. Yeah. And then they'll let things compound and build and then they'll yep. be like fucking blow up. But yeah, in, this, in the soft community, it's interesting because people, for being really physically tough and mentally tough, they have a really hard time addressing people in a professional way when they have pro like very acute professional grievances with them. So we came to somebody, for instance, and said, I think this is where you failed X, Y, and Z. Typically the operator on the other side of the table would go, you're fucking wrong. <laughs> You're an idiot. This is accurate. I've it never, is. I've, I've never said this. <laughs> this is accurate. Or they, they're, they're going to push back. They're going to be like, yeah, why don't you go fuck yourself? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You want to get 
I'm going to knock your fucking teeth out or something like that, right? Yeah. Like, like that's the, going to be the response. <laughs> so even in a professional development scenario where you're trying to address a person's shortcomings, what's going to happen, they're going to go- Based on an objective metric, by the yes, way. <laughs> they're going to go, that guy's a shit bag. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And then you're going to go mud suck him to 20 other guys on the in the in the company or the platoon yeah. or whatever and be like, that guy doesn't know what his fuck he's doing. He's, he's like- He doesn't like me because- He doesn't like me. He didn't go to the party. Yeah. That guy's fat. He hasn't shown up for PT in fucking three weeks. And it's like, God, I've heard those. That guy is missing two inches of his femur. He's recovering right now. I mean, there's a reason why. Yeah. Uh, but how many times have you heard that come out of another guy's mouth where it's like, hey, man, who knows? It's really difficult. Well, having been on the other on, side of that conversation, it's tough, right? Yeah. As a human being You're right. who has once or twice, or a, I would let other people assign a number to how many times I've <laughs> fallen short of that standard. It sucks being on the receiving end of that conversation and having to sit there and look in the mirror at yourself as opposed to try to look through the mirror at somebody else. Like, I get it. But that, and I, every time I've had to have those conversations with people, which oftentimes they wouldn't let me have those conversations with people. I'm not sure why that is. It's weird. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it could have been my approach or the inappropriate things that I was saying in addition to the feedback. Uh, you great bedside manner. Well, know? I tried. In those yeah. environments, I actually would look deep for any sense of professionalism that people often would seek from me, which right. was hard to find, but I would find it in those moments. Opening all the drawers. And I would, I would I would approach those situations from the perspective of how would I want to be talked to if I'm sitting in that chair? And it's a tough one because it, you, especially in the world we came from, right? Where you've been through, I mean, how much money do you think they spent? What do you think it costs to get through the ODA pipeline? I, I've read the 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 number and I forget, but it's it's a lot. So we're talking years and lot. millions of bucks. Yeah. I'd say for each of us at the sure. table, seven three, digits. I think it's more for you guys because we're better. But I yeah. mean, that's a different story. Um, yeah. It's more <laughs> intensive. Yeah. But you're sitting more there. Hair. You've made it through a pipeline. Yeah. You have, and in that pipeline, you're watching your peers strip away. Mm -hmm. So you are accomplishing things in an environment where. Not everybody is able to be successful. And then you get to a team and you're functioning with high performing peers. And then you're being sat down and told, hey, you're not meeting the standard. That's tough. It's, it's tough. tough to do that, having made it through that. Um, I think we've all been there. We've all been there. I, okay, hey, that's man. my question. Tell me about the times that you've been snapped in line oh, boy. and for what? So I've told this story before, and this is probably one of the best things that ever happened to me in my career <laughs> because it happened to me early. Okay. Um, so I, I was, I received my trident and I'll just jump ahead a little bit. Yeah. Six weeks later, it was taken back. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so again, the pipeline you go Shit. through, all I'd ever wanted to do was be a seal. Just like, I mean, I, I found this folder the other day that had like pictures of my room when I was in high school. It's power dork. Power dork, U.S. Navy SEAL flag that was like from Etsy. Fuck yeah. If Etsy even existed oh, back yeah. then. Definitely was made. From, like Chuck Sheen. Oh, Did God, you have Navy yeah. SEALs, the movie poster on your wall? Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Just dick brooms and MP5 yeah. SDs oh, running around. <laughs> Charlie yeah. Sheen. And Nomex flight suits just yes. sweating. Sweating your, your balls, balls off. off. Yeah. It will, you know. This is a rabbit hole, but Hulk Hogan had a <laughs> uh, had a had a show. I sent it to a text from to, to Crenshaw the other day because Hulk Hogan wore an eye patch and he was like driving around the speedboat. I forget what it was called. It's like Tropic Tropic Sun or or whatever it was. To look so that. Hulk Hogan played a Navy SEAL one in Navy a SEAL. one season television show. The trailer to this, which I'll pull up and, and put an attachment to this, <laughs> yeah. epic. It's just Hulk yeah. Hogan and there's a guy beside him. He's got a fucking 357. He's just like twirling, uh, twirling it around and they've both got these big dick brooms and a fucking eye patch and a speedboat. And I'm like, that was cool. Like there was a bunch of kids it's my still age. still cool. I'm well, going to say you're right. Yeah. <laughs> it's fair. It's okay, we... okay, keep, keep going. Continue. Sorry. So... Again, to power, power dork looking back and, and like my aunt was a Navy chaplain. And for Christmas one year, she gave me a trident. And I had assumed that she had gotten it from somebody. I didn't realize later you could go into just any buy, Navy exchange and the buy them. It's a just, way easier way to get one. It is total. And now yeah. it's just the internet like shortens that process <laughs> even more. You don't have to go anywhere if you can wait long enough. 
So everything I wanted to do was be a team guy. And I go to, you know, I go to high school, wasn't a scholastic uh, overachiever, we'll put it, but I wanted to play sports. So I would go <laughs> academic probation, not academic probation, academic probation, not academic probation. I never took my SATs. And again, the, the, the foundation that I'm laying is not what I recommend for most people because, you know, again, fast forward a few years, I didn't know how many people got hurt. I went back as an instructor and watched awesome guys have their dreams ripped away because the grip on one of the obstacles at the obstacle course was wet and they powder both femurs. It's like, sorry, man. Oh. Like, and then, and then I saw myself in that. And I was like, okay, that, that was a, not that it was an irresponsible approach from my side of the house, but it was slightly irresponsible. I could have had other options, but then I think, would I have thought of those other options right. when things sucked? Because that training is designed to suck. So I don't know, that one's neither here nor there. I'm telling people what I did. I'm not recommending yeah, yeah. that they do it. So it's not a prescription. Junior year in high school, join the Navy, ship off to boot camp right after graduating high school. I go and, you know, in the fourth week of boot camp, I think it was, they play the little, it was a VHS tape at the time. Who wants to be a frogman? Raise your hand. You go and take a screening test that has nothing to do with your ability to become a SEAL because it's push ups, pull ups, sit ups, and a run uh, and a swim, too. And a swim. You can't forget that. And incredibly tough numbers. Yeah, I know. Um, but surprisingly <laughs> enough, People Many fail it. Yeah, people, people fail. Failed it. It's insane. like, okay, well, uh, thankfully this is here because you certainly would have failed on day one. <laughs> this door to entry is a low. Yeah, like the, you you have to actually like fall down in front of this hurdle to not make it over this hurdle. Like, what the fuck? So, and then you got to pick your school because the attrition rate of BUDS being what it is, most people don't make it through. And they realize that sending people to BUDS absent a job skill or a training, uh, they call it a... What is it in the Navy? It's an NEC. It's yeah. an MOS for you on the... What's that NEC stand for? Naval Enlistment Classification, I think. Okay. It's the or numeric code, code that... that. It, yeah. Got it. Um, and I don't know what any of them are other than 5326, which is... That ties into the story because they changed that on mine for a short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, buddy. So you got to pick a school. And I looked at the list and I was like, what is the shortest school? So I went to become a radar scope operator. And then I checked in at BUDS right after that. So I had been in the Navy. I joined in August. I was in BUDS in January of the next year. So less than like five months, right. less than that. And I go through BUDS and surrounded by people are like, this is all I've ever wanted to do and I'm never going to quit. All 180 of us, fucking 18 were there the last day. Yeah. So I don't know what people's threshold is for this is all I've ever wanted to do in my life and nothing can stop me. But 162 of those people had a different threshold or got really, really, really hurt, which I right. didn't know until I went back as an instructor. Because if you don't show up for the next evolution, I was actually thinking about this. I've never talked to anybody who was in my class who quit. They just mm. vaporized from my life. Right. Because the machine goes on. So I don't know what happens in right. their life. It's, it's a lot like surviving a zombie apocalypse. You're just Dude, like, you keep going. If you're not on like the run to breakfast, like <laughs> where Bob go? Keep going. Fuck Bob, we're going to lunch. <laughs> yeah. so. Leave him. You can't save them all. Yeah. So I make it through BUDS. I got very lucky. I made it through with my original class. Go out to jump school when they st sent us all to Benning, which was a terrible it, idea. They sent my entire class to Fort Benning. Sergeant Airborne Did had, you guys all graduate from there? Because I'm surprised yes. that all 18 of you guys- We all went there and Sergeant graduated. Airborne- graduated. And some rollbacks that were waiting. So it was like 30 of us who were there. And but I'm just surprised you guys could- it could make it because it seems like you're going from kind of easier training, but then you're you're going to airborne selection. Yeah, you're. Could you guys survive that? Because that's like uniforms. what uniforms. Yeah. That's like uniforms are more difficult to wear. Mile run, right? skin of the teeth to make it through. When they, <laughs> when they drop you down on the cables, and I think you're cranking out ten. It was yeah. You know, we held on there. As well, a group. they can only give you ten push-ups. They can't give you more. Probably not. And you can yet. only beat your boots for yeah. 10. No, you can't have more. So I that's why you're just like, whatever. Okay. I, well. I considered quitting more when I was learning how to PLF for a week than mm -hmm. I did while I was at Bud's. And for people they, listening, PLF parachute landing fall, you can do it forward and backwards, left mm -hmm. or right. And then of course, don't forget the obliques. And I'm not joking when I say we spent five days mastering that. Well, that, that what... What I say is that's the most difficult school where they've packed three days of training into, into three, three weeks. weeks. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it, it's it's really tough stuff. So get through that, and then I check into a team on the West Coast, and I was there for a little bit, and then they have the additional training that you need to do, um, which they now call SQT SEAL qualification training. When I went through, it was called STT SEAL tactical training, and it was held run originally run by each team. 
And of course, you can probably see this as a bad idea because each team teaches like a slightly different thing. And they're like, eh, let's not do that. So then we'll do one on the East Coast and West Coast. But then it's like, eh, we're kind of teaching different things. And now it's consolidated. It's, it's consolidated yeah, and right. it's a pipeline and they go buds, static line, free fall, uh, Kodiak for winter training. And it just comes out and they get issued their tried and then they go to their team. So you're, right. I don't want to say cookie cutter, but they're cookie cutter. And that's a good thing because it's a standardized template. Yeah, so everybody not, shows up the same. Yeah. So I'm in STT and I go back to team five. And then to get my Trident, you had to do a Trident review board. So all these salty motherfuckers. A lot of, lot of dick brooms in that Dude, room. not only like, dick brooms, but UDT shorts and portions oh, of dicks hanging yeah. out of UDT Balls, shorts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bubble gum and fucking crankshaft yeah. hanging okay, out okay, potentially. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And for those listening, UDT shorts have about a quarter inch inseam. Yeah. And, are made, that, canvas, that, right? and are made of canvas. Yeah. And we used to do evolutions where, and this is, I don't, I don't know like the ratio of gayness, but this is high. It would be the entire SEAL Team 5 with their boots facing in the circle doing flutter kicks in UDT shorts oh, with yeah. just shit hanging out yeah. everywhere at an unacceptable level. Yeah. We willingly wore shirts, those shorts. Yeah. Tucked in. Yeah. I have no explanation for with, why with I wore the, those with shorts. With the boots no, and, no. The, and the socks. Jungle too. boots Jungle and boots. dive socks. Yeah, and dive the dive socks, socks rolled over. Rolled over. Yeah. Rolled over. It looks... I when can't you, answer for back my It's no look, longer a thing. But yeah. when you go back and look at stuff, and I did recently, I was I was perusing some videos somewhere. Some I was like, this looks like a village people convention. Yeah. He, like, when we... Well, when like we a tryout were, for just the one person. Yeah. When we were when we were at Fort Bragg, which is this is super quick segue, and then we'll get back. We you know uh, the catch me fuck me shorts, right? Yeah. The silkies, ranger the re- panties. Yes, ranger, ranger panties, panties <laughs> catch me fuck me silkies, whatever you want to call them. They're really high, they're really thin, and you can see your junk rattling around in these things while yeah. you're running. It's an eye patch basically stretched out into the size of a short, and it takes and about six seconds some, of perspiration, and then they're just they're yeah. clear. Yeah. I used to wear these everywhere they're all like, the time. They're because like it was, Dick Saran Wrap if you yes. sweat. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I think about it now, I'm like, this is unacceptable. You yeah. shouldn't have wore those anywhere in public. They're and not even fucking underwear. I have and no excuse guys going to for my behavior. And yeah. So did I. Yeah. I was thinking no, about it. Did. I was running down on the dikes with uh, one of my buddies several years ago. And he was like, I showed up for the run. And he's like, what are you doing, man? I was like, <laughs> going for a run. He's like, no, but seriously, are you going to put some fucking clothes on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the like, look, dude, the look when I got in was still black jungle boot, cotton dive sock rolled two to yeah. three times. So like an excessive amount of fabric. Yeah, fuck yeah. UDT short, t-shirt tucked in. Tucked in. Tucked in, tucked in tucked with in. like a quick release on the UDT short oh, belt, yeah. belt and, uh, which oh, yeah. by the way is M not- frames? Yeah, it's not actually a belt because it only just starts right well, here. It's and, a cinch strap. In the UDT shorts, there's no like fly, so oh, yeah. it does nothing. Mm-hmm. It's a flare piece. Okay. Brown shirt tucked in, M frames, and a fucking starched six point oh, cover, dude. Yes. <laughs> there is that only changed. That was I the am, pinnacle. I am and, and. fully erect right now. Get this. <laughs> this was so ingrained that that only changed a few years after I showed up to my first team. Yeah. It had its no. I, it, it was yeah. it. It was Decades it long. was through the entire the whole war, the entire war. special operations community. Yeah. You showed up somewhere, and it was like you better look like that. You you have to look this way. Yeah. If you didn't look this way, like was, I, I my theory on this was that a long time ago, when it was not socially acceptable to be a homosexual in the military, right, and you had to hide. There were some exceptional homosexuals that went into special operations and defined the entire dress code for everybody because they're like, I want to look at fucking dick all day long. <laughs> and they and these guys are going to be in the surf. <laughs> and, there, and there was some instructor that was like, oh, these motherfuckers think that I'm straight as an arrow. <laughs> I'm going to see their dicks all day, see, that's every they, day. And that, I'm just like, uh, I swear, that's what I, I, that's I was when like. They, that's when they tricked us all. Like, they you tricked know, us you know all. What, you know like, what? You cannot wear anything under those UDT shorts. That'll cause static there, and an explosion. There was, there was so a, no, no underwear under your shorts. There was, yeah. a, there was an old salty, like Master Chief <laughs> that was a flamer at one point in time that was like, and got us all. Got got everybody. He yeah. got everybody in the system. He was like the baddest motherfucker on the planet. You know what I mean? 
But what he wanted to do was just see junk all day long. So he was like, fuck meet, it. Meat gaze. Yeah, he just wanted to meet gaze all day long. He was, he was one cock-hungry motherfucker yeah. that was like, I'm going to change the entire dress code of the community. And everybody listened to him because they're like, he was probably Scary. salty as fuck. Maybe had an MOH or some shit, you know, yeah. and was like- Just tats everywhere. Yeah, just- Yeah, probably just, just a full on like waxed yeah. end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And mirrored M frames because he was yes. just looking he, at crankshaft all day. He, he had, that's where the M frames. That's where the M frames came from. Full coverage because he was he, yeah, needed, full he needed full coverage. He had to be able to go three sixty left and right to be able to pick up all the junk whenever he wanted it. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I have no. I'm embarrassed for the uh, for the look that I was a part of for many years, and I am ashamed of my behavior. I have no explanation or excuse for it. It just I. I that's what we wore. So back to fresh check-in, Andy. Okay, so I get through the pipeline um, and you still don't have your Trident, but I'm in my first mm -hmm. platoon, the first uh, operational element uh, at a SEAL team. I think there was six of them at the time and they bumped it to eight, you know, Alpha Bravo, Charlie Delta and on down in the phonetic alphabet. And there were four of us who were brand new, no Tridents, and then old senior guys. And I can only speak for myself, but finally arriving at a team and I get assigned to a platoon. I was working with my fucking heroes and right. what they said was the law and what they asked me to, I would, they're like, if they put out a hotbed of coals with some glass beyond that and tax and said, you need to, you know, roll over this, I would say, Roger that. And I would do right. it. So you study all these different things that you're supposed to be able to do. Demo, planning, open and closed circuit diving, jump questions, warfare questions, maneuver questions, taking apart, you know, I, you go into one of these rooms and again, it's all these senior dudes and there was an M60 on the table and like a AR and a SIG 226 and you got to disassemble everything and talk about all the pieces and put them back together. And then you're like, okay, go over to the, the demo guy and you're doing a demo calculation on a C4 charge or minimum safe distance. And then all of this stuff, if you pass that at the end, you get your Trident, which is where they change your NEC to 5326. So me and uh, all four of the guys in our platoon passed that board. It's a, it's like a three day thing. It's a very, and for people listening in the SEAL community, there's a huge difference between being in the community, having not gotten your Trident and being in the community and having received your Trident. Right. It's not that you've arrived, but you are at least now on paper from everybody else looking like I, we can all look at somebody's dress uniform specifically and be like, fob it, fob it, fob it, not awesome, this dude is out there fucking getting after it. But to a normal person, it, in this day, it was just camis and a patched trident. Everybody looked the same. So, I, I mean, I looked like I was fucking 14, so people wouldn't have thought I was there for a decade. Right. Yeah, yeah. But if we stand up next to each other, we're all the same. So we pass, we get our tridents. And the first trip that we're going to do as a platoon is out to Tucson, Arizona. And we're out there calling uh, CAS, close air support with the A-10s, which were awesome. And I think there was some F-16s out there too, working out of davis Monthan Air Force Base, which is where we were staying because this ties into the story. <laughs> <there. Ooh, yeah. laughs> at the barracks of davis Monthan, And on the, not the last day of training, the day before the last day, we're getting ready to drive out to the range and we get the call that the aircraft are unavailable. I think it might've been a, uh, a weather kink. It's like 10 o'clock in the morning full platoon of guys, we have no training. And so the decision is what we should do, the most responsible thing to do is immediately go to a strip club, strip club and then start drinking. Of course. I'm 20 at the time, underage. So I acquire the ID card of another person in the platoon who looks right. similar to me. Right. He just uses his driver's license. We go into said establishment. Mm -hmm. We begin drinking. We leave this place well after dark go down to an Irish bar in downtown Tucson. Uh, not a lot going on in there, but there, as with any group, there's different personalities. And we had one individual who, we'll just call him a little, a little mouthy from time to time. He liked to give people his opinion of their physical looks, Got it. feedback on yeah. their physique. Okay. There was a woman at the bar who he had a, a 10 point bullet point on that he wanted to provide her she was related to the owner. Okay. He did not know this as he was giving her the debrief right. on where he thought she stood. So I look over and, you know, some guys are shooting pool and, you know, the rest of us are just sitting there drinking. I look over and he's being pulled out of the bar by the bouncers. 
So this obviously gets attention. We go outside. He's being laid on by the bouncers and the cops have been called. Cops come, cops take him, put him in the back of the cop car. And at this point, I'm watching some of the senior guys in the platoon. They're going and talking to the cops like, hey, yada, yada, yada. I remember them talking to me briefly. Who, you know, who are you guys? What are you doing here? What's going on? Eventually, hey, we're going to let him out of the car. But here's what you guys have to do. You need to leave and you need to go back to wherever it is you're staying. And we don't have any more problems with you guys. This, this is well pre-9-11. We're talking 97 at this point. Right. Uh, so, immediately upon being let out of the cop car, he decides he had a few more things he wanted to talk to the bouncer about. <laughs> Why wouldn't he? Meanwhile, most of the guys from the platoon, like if the bar is here and there's a cop car... And then the other side of the street, most of the guys from the platoon are already over here. Like they've already <laughs> they've left. They've already moved on. And I'm just kind of like, yeah, we're like, okay, fuck it. Because we were rolling around in a Ford Econoline, you know, 15 pack van. Uh, I think we did have a DD, a designated enough driver. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like me and another guy. And I was actually the closest guy to this person. He immediately goes over to the side door and just starts Yep, 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 yipping at the bouncers. And there's two guys standing there. One guy was on crutches because his leg was in a cast. And the other guy was not. And I'm sitting here. I weighed 175, maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was, you're what? Six, six even. Yeah, I was six, six foot even. 150 yeah. when I graduated high school. I gained weight in buds. Solid. I hit 200 pounds in my mid 20s and haven't looked back since. Right. Um, but point being, I'm the smallest fucking dude in this story by a right. substantial margin. Uh, I don't know how to fight. Um, I'm sitting there. And so he flips around because I well, apparently his debrief of the situation was over and starts walking the other way. And so now he's walking at me and I'm looking at the bouncers behind him. And I see the guy pick up a crutch, grab it by the bottom and bring it back like he's getting ready to swing it. Of course. So I step just to the side and pulled a Spyderco out of my pocket. <laughs> That escalated quickly. It did. Mm -hmm. um, flipped it open, put it down by the side of my leg. And I was like, hey, man, I don't think you want to do this. And he put his crutch down and I folded the knife up and put it back in my pocket. And I thought that this was going to be the end of it. And as he continued to walk, I hear the bouncer yelling to the police that are just down the road. He's got a knife. And at this point, I reached a critical decision making matrix. And it was actually simple. There was only two branches. Right. And I think there's a song about this. Do I stay or do I go? Do, yeah. <laughs> so I hand the knife off to a guy who's in the platoon, who shall remain nameless because he's still active duty. Solid. And as I hear the cop car come this direction, I run and I take off running and I- You're fast. I was even faster then. Yeah. I was even faster then. So I go- a cop car. And I, huck, I remember taking a right and going down- an alley because I could hear the cop cars going over the gravel in the alley directly behind me. Mind you, I have no plan. I am just going at maximum speed. Yeah, solid. So I'm running and I realize that now is the time to go over the fence. So I remember grabbing a chain link fence. My Both of my feet came off the ground and I jumped and it was a uh, razor wire on top, which oh, is where wow. this scar in my hand okay, still comes from. Okay. Grabbed it, cleared it, and as I'm Shut grabbing up. and going over, I feel the cop's hand brush the bottom no. of my shoe. So full puncture into my hand, up over, climbed a tree onto a conexpex, got onto a roof, and continued my evasion. So now I'm roof jumping. Yes. I get to the edge of the, it was like a block, essentially. So there's nowhere else to go, but there's a huge tree overhanging the edge of the building. I was like, okay, I know what I'm going to do. Your hand is bleeding profusely. Of course, yes. yeah. Um, so I know what I'm going to do, though. I'm going to hang off the side of the building Correct. over where the trees are hold, you know, over the top so they can't see my fingers. And I did that until I um, realized I was not going to be able to hold on Correct. much longer. Yep. I let go. Oh. Remember doing two quick rolls Solid. up of the window. Okay, okay. Flat on my back on the concrete, landed directly in front of my platoon that I had just run away from. Oh, wow. <laughs> so... They Let's pick me up. up. No. 
sports. We went across the street to another bar. One of the guys was a corpsman. He gave me some first aid on my hand. We switched t-shirts. Yep. And for the next 30 to 45 minutes, we watched cop cars going around and then the spotlight from the helicopter. Yeah. Oh, wow. (laughs) And the helicopter. (laughs) They were looking for me. We were continuing to drink. We That died down. We left. The individual that was mouthy at the first bar got mouthy with some random people on the street, got his ass beat. We get into the car. He is in the front right passenger seat. I am in the back. I'm thinking this could possibly be the most legendary tale of my life ever. Nothing will ever beat this night. I just had an amazing night of drinking. My first time out, I'm a goddamn Navy SEAL. No rules apply to us. I don't know if everybody just saw this, but we basically just owned everything. You owned the night. We owned the night (laughs) and we were gonna own every night from there forward. (laughs) We pull up to the front gate at Davis Monthan and the gate guard is looking at the guy in the front right seat who is bleeding out of his nose because it was broken and said, what happened to you? And his response was, I kicked my own ass. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'll give him credit for that. The second question from the gate guard was, is there an Andy Stump in your vehicle? <laughs> oh. <laughs> because apparently when we were talking to the cops, we told them exactly who we were, where we were staying. Uh, they had already called SEAL Team 5 and talked to the command career counselor, <laughs> which he later on subsequently told me that it was a relatively legendary phone call because they opened with, hey, uh, we just want to let you know that that was one of the most impressive things that we've ever seen. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> How, yeah. However, um, you know, I, I was cuffed. So I got out of the car. They put me in the back of the cop car, cuffs, citations, all that stuff. They ended up letting me go. And uh, the next day we drive back to the command where the command master chief is there waiting for us in a classroom and like flips a table. Like that's how he opens the conversation. I realized at that point I might be in just a scotch of trouble. <laughs> so like eight of us had to go to a, uh, a, essentially a DRB, a disciplinary review board, which then went to executive officer's mast for me and then captain's mast. But I had to go through like a chief's board first. And I was the last person to go in. So my entire, you know, like those eight guys are all lined up and the chief's board, it was, they were at a table about this side and there was a white board, like uh, where this artwork is behind you. And these were like the salty dudes. They're all like, they're extremely senior. So I'm the last guy to go in. And the person who had been in there before me had written like a schematic of the whole layout and drawn like what had happened. And, uh, you know, the first question from the chief one of the senior chiefs that had put me through buds, just a legend in the community, he goes, so you want to uh, you want to talk us through why you did what you did? And I did, I mean, and I realized going into this that the way that I had thought about my station in life and what I thought a SEAL was and the fact that I'll just blindly follow the people that I work with, regardless if they're doing dumb fucking shit. Right. That all changed for me. So I did not try to make a single excuse from that chief board all the way through Exo's mass and CO's mass. I completely owned it. I was like, listen, I didn't know what else to do in that situation. I realized that what I did was wrong, but my motivation for doing so is I was trying to protect the other member of the platoon. I didn't want it to escalate into a fight. I shouldn't have run from the cops. That is on me. And I just owned it the entire way through. So I go through that. I go through XO's mass, which is a freaking administrative step. They're basically just going to kick you to CO's mass. I go to CO's mass and I'm sitting there and I'm in my camis with the sewn on patch and he just slides a pair of scissors across the table. It's like, why don't you go ahead and cut that off? So he didn't strip my NEC, but he wouldn't let me wear it for six months. And then I got it back uh, in an exercise in Korea called uh, Foul Eagle that I went to year after year after year. But it was a huge like snapback in it because I almost lost it. I thought I might be done right there and all right. of that work that I had just gone through. And I realized I had watched some dumb shit play out that night. I should have stopped that individual from running his mouth in both of those occasions, but I didn't. Why? Because he had two platoons. Oh, Peacetime, yeah. right? So he'd been a SEAL for like six, eight years. I thought they walked on water and I thought that that was going to be the end of it, you know? So I got that back. Fast forward to 2001 when I'm screening for a development group. 
and I do the physical test first and you do the psych test and the shrink test and the assessment and all that stuff, I go into a room that was much different because the classic horseshoe where they're all sitting and there's a single table in between, like a fucking sixth grade little thing with like the little desk on the side <laughs> and I'm in my dress blues. I'm like, hello, I'd like to come to your command. The number one question, guy's like, so why don't you tell us about what happened in Tucson? I was like, holy shit. So I did the same thing. And then the guy asked me, well, what did you learn from that? And what would you do differently? And I just explained to him, you know, what I've already talked about, the things that I learned. And then one of the senior master chiefs there was like, okay, well, what if it was me in that situation? What would you have done? I said, I would have stopped you. He's like, well, what if I wouldn't have let you? And I was like, well, I would have forced you. And then they dropped it right there and moved on. So it completely recalibrated. And I, and imagine that not happening in my career. What a, not that I'm not a, a fucked hard as it is, but the number of dumb things that I would have done because I wouldn't have had that environment or that recalibration of thinking about who I am, what it meant, personal accountability, the response, all of it, it is st it's stuck with me since that day because I almost lost it and I'm so thankful that it happened. Uh, and in the end, we got the uh, bouncer to drop the charges because we sent him a t-shirt. That is solid. <laughs> Just one t-shirt. One t-shirt from SEAL That's Team 5. Oh, wow. That is a super inexpensive... Well, but that is the power that it has had on me to be on the other side of that conversation. And then I've, you know, later in my career, I was in meetings where I I took people's tridents. We were doing- How many DRBs or trident review boards have you probably seen? Yeah, I've been there when the, I've taken three people's tridents. Yeah. And so I've been on that- For other, good. For good, like, like they're, they're getting ejected. Them, right? Which usually is the case. Yeah. Usually it's, that's off, you are out of the community. But I remember being on that other side, you know, they're there and they're dressed yeah. white. It's literally- shaking like a dog shitting razor blades and you're sitting there trying to make a decision as to whether or not can they learn from this or has there been catastrophic damage? And in the three instances where they lost their tridents, it was just catastrophic, even from a legal perspective. I mean, like usually, right. usually when they get to that point, like if they're in a Trident review board, yeah. usually they're gone. Yeah. Like they've, that, that is the end of the line. But it was powerful. And like I said, I'm glad that it happened. It's hard to fucking beat that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I wish I could. I, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. It's like, I'm I, go there. okay. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Do you have anything? Did you ever, did you ever get like sewn up? I mean, kind of, we, we had a couple people in my second platoon show up late, including myself more than once to uh, morning musters just for the platoon. So and uh, I, he I, gets rolled up by the cops, yeah. rips his hand open, and you're talking about being late? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm like, that's why I'm like, let's not do the story. <laughs> right. No. But, uh, the end result of that story is uh, I was the last one to be late the last time. Right. And, uh, Chief was like, hey, um, get back here. Right. And sent everybody outside of, uh, outside of the space, and they could hear him yelling at me. Yeah. From inside the space. Um. And uh, so the end result was I shaved my head and was in dress camis um, as a gate guard for a week. <laughs> <laughs> that used to be the DUI. <laughs> That's, great. That's great. That used to be yeah. DUI punishment for the West Coast teams. So there's the... the <laughs> it's a standard punishment. Yeah, there's, but, uh, an ocean, there's the ocean side seen. where right. all the teams are. And then there's the NAB Coronado. And occasionally you'd see a dude out there in his dress whites <laughs> trident just like... <laughs> just wave, wave yeah. and people. And you're like, yeah, get that DUI. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fuck. That was a fun one. What I'll say about, you know, having people being able to yell at you and the whole experience <laughs> that I went through, not a single person yelled at me. Yeah. The senior leaders, what they did is they showed me the severity of the consequences and they threatened me that if I ever did anything like that again, mm -hmm. I would be gone. And that is a tactic that I used when I was dealing with other people in a disciplinary issue, like there's no reason to yell. Like we both know that you fucked up, so we're gonna talk about it. Yeah. And I'm gonna lay out to you the severity of the consequences that are gonna come if this happens again. And then we're gonna focus on the fact that you can learn from this and this is teachable, but I'm not gonna, I mean, you know I mean? Yelling has its place, yeah. but I don't think it's very effective. So he, so the stone, so he was not yelling because he was trying to fix the situation by yelling. He was yelling because he was, fucking ballistically pissed that we were late again. Right. He was pissed at everybody and I was the target well deservedly because yeah. I was fucking late. Right. But he got to yell at me for everybody. Which everybody heard anyways. I'm, I'm trying I, it was to, well deserved. Like I Yeah. I'm trying yeah. to think. I, I think there were a couple it was a good one. There are a couple points where it stood out for me, I think. Because I've been mean, there <clears> were, there were several. 
I had a, I had a, I had a, I had, a, I had, a, I had some issues. I had a few issues, but early on, I think well, I was an E4 and I had a team leader. It was an E5, and I had uh, we were on a range, and I had talked back. Uh, I had said something. I can't remember exactly what it was. <laughs> And um, I spent all the afternoon and well into that evening uh, doing, uh, I'm up, he sees me, I'm down um, to muscle failure multiple times. You call that IMT, individual uh, movement technique. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> With a buddy carry in there to the point of which we did IV training afterwards because you were I, was, gonna die. I was going to uh, Die. My yeah. tongue was swelling up in my fucking mouth because I was so dehydrated and I had no more sweat. You'll be doing this sweat. until I'm tired. No, no, it, it was, and it was impressive because he was, uh, he wasn't angry. He was like- Just letting it happen. He, yeah, like you, kind you of were, like- You were correcting take yourself. Me, he, he took me by the hand on that one, you know? He's just like, it's hey, more I'm going to show you. they don't yell. Let me help no, no, you help because yourself. Because it's, it's scarier. Yeah. It is. And you think it's going to end and then it's like, it just doesn't end. And I kept coming back because I'd have to go. I remember <clears> so acutely, like I'd have to go up this hill and then back the hill. And then at the very bottom of the hill, there, there was a, um, a big ditch that was full of like overgrown weeds and mud. And so I'd have to low crawl through the weeds and mud, of which course. was super nice. And then you'd do it again and you'd do it again. But I was like- Washes you off. Yeah, but I was like, yeah, oh, this will, I was thinking like one or two or whatever, you know? Seven uh -huh. hours later. No, 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 no. Uh uh. Nope. It, it was impressive as to how long he just stayed there in uh in the same monotone voice. Um so that that was that was one of the things where it really stuck with me. It stuck with me so to the point where I don't think I got mouthy with one I, I mean I had a few times when I got to be an E6, I would imagine, because then you're like feeling your fucking Yeah, sewing the oats a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're feeling it a little bit. <laughs> And then um, I, uh, I was late getting to a communications class one day and there was another 18 Echo running the class. And um, I was getting coffee for the commander. He called me. He was like, hey, can you grab some coffee for everybody? I was like, sure. So I was late. I came into this classroom. It was full of other 18 Echoes, comms guys. But how many excuses are there to be late? And he's like, oh. And the guy, the 18 Echo that was running it, he was a seven, mm -hmm. I was a six. And uh, he starts fucking coming in at me like, Oh, so grateful to have your presence and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm sitting in there at this desk and it's like, uh, his name was Bob. I was like, Bob, you know, I have a legitimate reason or whatever, right? And he kept fucking going. So I stood up and I folded the back of his fucking shirt over hockey style and I started fucking giving him the business <laughs> in front of the entire class. <laughs> and, uh, that almost got me completely yeah. kicked out. Yeah. Um, the commander brought me in I was like if we weren't going to war this would probably be your last day here so um congratulations can consider yourself <laughs> lucky <laughs> lucky me yeah uh so I, yeah i think that there were a few incidents there where and then later in life because you realize like there's disrespect there's unprofessionalism there's being fucked up right and i've been all of those things at one point in time, multiple times. Sometimes in combination for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes. Usually but, they're compounding efforts. Yeah. Yeah, they're compounding, right? And then, yeah. It, it, when you look back on them, it's like, man, I fucked this up. And sometimes you look back and you're like, man, I should have just fucked that dude up, like <laughs> verbally. You know what I mean? Like, because I'm not promoting that as a, as a, as a method. I'm just saying, if you're going to burn a bridge, like you might as well just light, light it on fire no, make just sure say, fuck it. It's gone. Yeah. No more bridge. No more bridge. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, I think, I think later I just had, I probably had earlier and in, in there, like earlier in my career, I had some anger issues, I would imagine that I was just kind of working through, you know, OIF one, I had a lot of anger issues that I kind of worked my way through. And I think the fear of death more, more, more than anything just kind of set the course right. Whereas like, oh yeah, hey, yeah, I could just be a little bit cooler. I don't really have to be that big of a dick, yeah. you know? Like when I just have your have mortality to thrown in your face consistently like yeah. that, it recalibrates. Kind of recalibrates everything. I, I tell that to people, I'm like, I... Like it was, a, it was a good experience from to some degree because I realized like you don't have to be an asshole to be combat effective. Whereas before... 
in that late nineties era where all those like iconic Attitude old salty, and machismo. Yeah. Like you're thinking, man, I'm going to have to be hard. Like I used to have this idea, like I didn't wear socks. I didn't use AC. Oh, I didn't wear underwear. I didn't fucking watch TV. Like I was like, I, I, I completely taken everything out. Like, like this deprivation yes. theory. But yeah. It was a deprivation theory where <laughs> I, 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 I was depriving myself of every luxury because I was like, I'm going to be fucking hard. Right. And then I realized like, oh, well, my feet just really stink all the time because I don't wear fucking socks. And, you know, my back hurts. I, heat is a good thing in your Jeep because ultimately a defrost is, you know, works your windows and it's a little bit dangerous if you're trying to do things, you know, <laughs> like scrape it. Yeah. But I realized you didn't have to be an asshole and you also didn't have to be like depriving yourself all the time. So it was a good, it was a good experience. I think there was a lot of growth that actually come out of that. Yeah. Um, I'm just glad mine happened early in my career. It really had an impact on my life. I am so happy for those moments. Like some of those guys, like to, to your point, like just getting the shit, <clears throat> not beat out of you physically, but the shit just like beat, you're, you're, you're getting beat the fuck up physically. And those are incredible moments of growth for a guy that's, you know, 18, 19, 20. Mm -hmm. yeah. The humble pie that you have to fucking swallow it, it's, it's, it, I think it, it, it generates a better man ultimately towards the, toward, you know, especially as, as you start to evolve and move past it. If you have a mission and you're dedicated to it and you're like, I don't give a fuck. I, I'm going to think outside of this circumstance. I'm going to go through this. I, I'm super happy with being able to have that and those, those moments, like truly, I think they made me a much better person. Like I, I can't imagine the person I would be without those experiences. Like I, I not that I would be an asshole, Maybe. Maybe, you know. I actually think there's value to getting your ass beat physically too. For sure. I you actually need to get punched in the face every now and then. I again. think yeah. that every adult male needs to uh, get into a physical confrontation. And I would add to that, <laughs> you need to lose at some point. Correct. Because it, you know, if you've never had somebody um, cash the check that you've been <laughs> writing with your mouth by being yeah. a smart ass, you have no understanding of when you're pushing it too far. And then you're like, oh, oh, okay, there's consequences to the things that I say and I'm not nearly the badass that I think that I am and maybe I should actually learn how to fight before I run my mouth. Like there's growth to come from that too. Yeah, there's a lot of growth. I, I think that's yeah. why if you, I mean, how often are you rolling now? Two hours a day. Pretty much five days, six mm -hmm. days a week. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I can imagine there's, individual growth just through that circumstance because you know that people yeah. can fucking oh, it's, kick your ass. It uh, You go in there and, and you realize that you're being pretzeled up by a dude who's an accountant. Right. <laughs> who right. looks like I did when I graduated high school and you can't figure out how the fuck they're making weight and leverage work in that direction. You're just like, you know what? It, well, and also having that outlet every single day, it, I have no desire to get into an argument with anybody anywhere. Like the last thing I actually want to do is fight somebody outside of the gym because I get to go immerse myself in voluntary violence every single day if I right. want to. I don't need to do it at a coffee shop. You know, if somebody cuts you off in traffic, it's just like, whatever, man. No, <laughs> it's, it's, you're right though. It's the, it's the worst, like, especially if you've been in those circumstances when you've been like grinding your face or in your back into the concrete. And like, it's just a, it's a horrible circumstance to find yourself in and you want to avoid it at all costs. You're like, oh God, man, I... I that's how I, I, look I at don't people, want to do that. That's how I look at people who, uh, the you know, the term of the hour, civil war. I'm like, stop. Stop. Please yeah. stop. And I'm not saying that you don't love your country. And I'm not saying that you don't believe in your own individual skills. And I'm sure you have weapons and gear and you train and all that. I'll give you all of that. But the concept of what you think you're getting into and the reality of it are so incredibly different. The people who I know who are the most adverse especially to ballistic confrontation are the people who have actually had that encounter or experience in their life, especially for a long period of time, they want nothing to do with it. No. The people who are the most vocal are the ones who have not actually touched it. And I don't want them to have to have that juxtaposition thrown in their face because it's not what you think it's going to be. 
Well, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of telephone tough guys, right? It's like there's a lot of YouTube, Twitter, telephone tough guys that are talking about things they have no comprehension. They, they, they have no ability to comprehend what it actually means. There's a total collapse of logistic support and services, you know, power and all these different things that we are intimately familiar with. It's like, I don't want my family to do that. I don't want the, you know, my, yeah. my kids and my family to have to live through these circumstances where yeah. I don't want you have refugee camps in the middle of the country. No, that's insane. That's what there would be. Right. There'd be refugee camps in states that didn't want to do something. It's, it's like, it'd be full on insanity. Every two to four years, you have the opportunity to, to, fix you know, it. fix it ish. And that's the beauty of the, of, of the system ultimately. But it, you do, you hear it, right? You hear the, 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 the rhetoric. And I think that dangerous forms of rhetoric that are out there. And a lot of this is just, you know, exactly that. It's just fucking yeah. hot air. And then you have obviously, you know, the two different sides, gaslighting each individual side and, you know, putting people more onto the extremes of the left and the right. And going back to our original concept of this conversation, which was leadership. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is that clickbait has been misinterpreted as leadership. That is absolutely incorrect. So the most salacious thing that you can do by posting your, you know, thumbnails and, you know, adding some salacious tagline. You'll is, never believe what so-and-so oh said. Oh my God, yeah. And it's like, <laughs> that's not leadership. No, it's you know? the exact opposite, It's the actually. exact opposite. So yeah. it's the news cycle contributes to this. The politicians contribute to this because they know when they're going to get airtime and when they're being yeah. recorded and when they're not yeah. being recorded. So then they're going to hold people to task, you know, on the floor for something that ultimately they're just trying to drive eyeballs in order to increase their own presence. It's the unfortunate reality of social media, right? And it's the unfortunate reality of their news, the big news companies and corporations dying and how people are consumed with their electronic devices. And ultimately, there's a lot of fiction out there. It's crazy. Yeah. It's like there's so many people out there running their fucking mouths. And, and you're it's like, echoed. Yeah. Like you're living in these echo chambers, right? and you're feeding it and you're being fomented into more and more anger mm -hmm. and more and more division. Well, the speed of information outpaces the truth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, like, I don't know. I mean, do you think that it's, what's the path out of it? Because I agree with you. Like I, I, I'll use the example of the, what happened in, in the Capitol on the 6th. And I, I don't, people think whatever you want to about that event. I'm talking about the coverage of that or the coverage leading up mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. So they're going after individuals that were there. And of course, I'm always going to believe in individual accountability and responsibility. Absolutely. So yeah, if you want to wear a, fuck, a fucking Viking helmet and go stand where the vice president stands, okay, suffer the consequences. That's for somebody else to decide. The legal system can handle that. But what about all the bullshit that mainstream media pushed on both sides and again, if people chose to be there and do those things, that's their responsibility. But what about the responsibility of that volume of information that was being pushed that people, I have to believe that they know it was bullshit, but there's no accountability and responsibility for that whatsoever. No. So how do we fix that? Because I don't have an answer. I don't for have it. an answer for that either, right? Because you can you can just watch the news cycle on either side. You can watch the news cycle on either side. You can You can listen to people and ultimately they're they're stirring the pot and they're spreading misinformation and there is an accountability because it's covered under opinion and they're making money off of that i think exactly. that's something that people forget uh a to, lot well to yeah. use fox news and sienna not that those are the only two sources sure. but one side of the aisle will point to one off and the other side of the aisle will point to the other their money is based off of a ratings network mhm mm and it's the same ratings network that shows like the Big Bang Theory or Friends or whatever the hell popular show these days. That's how they sell their ad revenue. So the higher the ratings, the higher they can sell their ad revenue. It's all in the same ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I think that people forget that that is the case. And that's a very dangerous disconnect in understanding to me. If people don't realize that they're trying to get your attention because that's how they sell fucking Tide Soap and Budweiser. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. You know. No, it's a it's a hundred percent true. Regardless of the the outlet, I don't think there are obviously they're just they're they're not 
a lot of unbiased networks that are just putting out information. You have to... Well, no, they're, they're editorializing everything and turning it all into opinion pieces. There's very little right. journalistic integrity that's going on. And most of it is being done on on contract base. Like these aren't mm -hmm. people that are, you know, the reporters you're going to see on the news doing a fill in the blank is doing an hour long segment on human trafficking, whatever, right? right? You know, they're they're trying to sell ad revenue. They're trying to keep their name out there. They're not, they're not trying to write a piece because it's important because it has to get put out. That's just not happening that much. You know, it, occasionally it does happen. Like there are some pieces where it's going on, but it's just not common because they're mm -hmm. trying to editorialize. They're trying to make more money. Money, 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 money is driving the conversation for those people. And it's a shame because how else is the general public supposed to get any information about some of these subjects that they can't touch on a daily basis, if not for somebody with some actual journalistic integrity? There's a few guys out there. They I mean, exist. Matt Taibbi is, uh, you know, Joe's... Yeah talked about him quite a bit. I, I, I listen, watch what he puts out. Uh, you know, Sager, Crystal and Sager, they put out halfway decent the information. Icarus and The Dissident. Yeah, so there's, right? there's Both good, excellent movies, by the way. Incredible. So it's, I think you have a few different, I, I, yeah. I mean, our blog is a great example. I'll plug it, you know. Coffee or Die, Marty yeah. Scovelin's done a, a hell of a job and we have conversations on a regular basis. Well, which there's is, broad scope. We are not... We are, like we stick to just the facts, and it would be really easy for Marty specifically because he he runs that outlet to try to drive more eyeballs. Mm -hmm. But it's more important for us just to stick to the facts. This is what happened. Yes, could we drive you know clickbaity bullshit for sure? Because you know it, it's marketing, and you know that's one thing that we're we're halfway decent at. We understand how to you know drive yeah. eyeballs. But coffee or die, it, it puts out at least two to three articles a day, a wide variety of issues. And Marty and I are constantly talking about just the facts, just the facts, just the facts. And we have writers from the left and writers from the right and they're writing information. It's fucking incredible. Like I, I watch and listen, or, you know, I listen to the, the series that we put out on Coffee or Die. I read the articles, probably 90% of them, obviously, because it's, it's you know, partly my job to do that. But more importantly, it's because I know the writers and I know how they're interpreting information and putting it out. They don't have a political agenda with what they're trying to do. And two, you know, that's part of where the coffee profits go to is saying, hey, let's provide really good information for people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're going to turn your money into something that I think you guys would all benefit from. Uh, that's, my, that's my two cents and my stump for coffee or die. It's a great blog. So if you want to check it out, go to coffeeordie.com. And, uh, you know, Marty's a former ranger. He writes over there. He's got a great, great crew. So check out Coffee or Die. So what's, uh, what's going on next? So what's next for Andy Cleared Hot? Who do you got, who do you got coming out on Cleared Hot? Uh, Monday's episode is going to be Kyle Carpenter. Oh, nice. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, story sitting down talking with him. It, uh, did he come to Whitefish? He did. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. You keep saying whitefish, but I live in Kalispell. I know. But I know I what just, you mean. I, Kalispell is, like, it's, it's really, it's a long word, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a much longer word than whitefish. whitefish. <laughs> so whitefish. <laughs> Two syllables. Yeah. So he, no, came, he so, came to Kalispell. He came to Kalispell. Uh, I just put out a podcast Monday with uh, Sean Rogers, an ex-Green uh, Beret who was a cop in Denver. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable story of what he had to go through growing up. Full, I mean, me... Uh, not being a legal expert or being an expert in his life, abuse, right. neglect, um, uh, uh, addicted, single family, home, gnarly, was able to do amazing things. Right. And then I sat down, you know, with Kyle and I have been, it's amazing to me the mentality that people like Kyle have after going through what they went through. Mm -hmm. The dude was in the hospital for three years and has one of the most positive attitudes of anybody that I've ever encountered is all about not letting what happened in the past stand in his way. He's accomplishing things that he probably wasn't even thinking about before he was injured jumping on the grenade. You know, he woke up five weeks after it happened. Oh, he, had a, he had a brief moment of consciousness when he thought his friends were throwing wa hot water on him. He thought they were fucking with him, but it was right. just him bleeding out. Um, and he had a moment to like, he's like, okay, this is my last moment on earth. And then he passed out, woke up five weeks later in the hospital 
with his parents by his bedside. And so we get into that pretty deeply in the podcast. But I leave those conversations just completely like refreshed. It like it fills up my batteries because mm-hmm. like I what am I complaining about? Uh, Chad Wright, who was on your guys' podcast, yeah, yeah. came up. I had that episode already recorded. The guy who taught me how to base jump, a mutual friend of Trevor and I's, yeah. Miles Dasher. Um, so I've actually got a, quite a few uh, already recorded. And I mean, what next is for me, I really like doing the podcast. I love right. the chance to sit down and talk with those people. So reaching out, talking to those people. Um, Chad Wright's a hoot, right? He is <laughs> yeah. funny. He's looking crazy. It's, like, it's hey, awesome. Give me this stimulus check. I'm going to buy a gun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that dude is so much fun, man. Yeah, we said we talked for like three hours too. I mean, the mile, conversation was Miles was awesome. I've got some guys uh, from our old job who are going to be coming in. I got the <laughs> host of uh, Forged in Fire, uh, Will Willis, who was a... Yeah, we know Will. Yeah, a yeah. ranger and then a PJ for yeah. 10 years. He's coming in Monday. So Finally. it's cool it, to be able to reach out and just talk with those people. I'm going right. to link up with Josh mm-hmm. uh, Smith, the Montana Knife Company guy. I'm going up there at the same time. I know, because I was yeah, talking yeah. to him on the phone. I figured you should probably come too, Trevor. Mm, okay. So When is that? Uh, I can't remember. It's February what? Late Feb. Like yeah, yeah. Late 23, Feb. 24, 25, okay. something like that. Yeah. Let's figure it out. Well, Josh f- and I have been talking for yeah. years. That, that I guy saw his is, knives on the desk. I recognize him. guy's incredible. It. Yeah. I, I honestly... I thought when uh, he sent me my first knife, I was like, this guy is, this is like a big factory where he makes them. Dude, but have you seen some of his custom It's Damascus amazing. Work? Yeah, it's <laughs> Holy amazing. fuck. It's crazy. He did some out of Black Rifle Coffee and we mine, get pinged. Yeah, we get pinged by knife makers quite a bit. Which oh, you're is talking cool. about the dip to get, make yeah. the Damascus yeah. pop? People don't know this. And I was talking to Josh about this, but I'm going to give myself six months to become the leading expert in Damascus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to focus. Totally, it's totally enough time. It yeah. is. It, it only took you that long to yeah. become an expert sommelier. So that's true. That is yeah. true. I actually just had another company reach out. They want me to do some reviews of their wines. Good. And they send boxes they to me. It. It says Master Sommelier Andy stuff. I'm listed on the Kalispell Wikipedia page as a sommelier. <laughs> <laughs> well, a None lot of, of this people, I had a hand in, by the way. I don't know if a lot of people even understand that we've had a we've had an ongoing joke for years now. Ongoing joke about you being the CEO of Black Rifle Coffee, founder and CEO. It but started, is it a joke though? We don't know. I, I don't know if we'll ever know. Right? Does the public know? We've talked the, about it. They, they, they might we know have. Because I'll say I'll be like. I think I've said use code Andy CEO. Then some people are like, and then shut it down. I'm like, whatever. I didn't. <laughs> and that's not true. They're probably just using a capital letter or oh, something. No. I've never shut it down. And we get customer service tickets all the time. They're like, Andy's the real CEO. It's a conspiracy. You know? and it's like, it's, uh, it's fucking it's hilarious. True. People have locked onto it more so than Evan and I had. And it started because I would wear black rifle shirts on flights and I'd be walking oh, to my seat. Yes. People are like, oh man, I love that coffee. I'm and like, yeah, man, this, I started it for hasn't you. Has this come <laughs> full circle on you? Where I mean, oh, I've had, I've, I've absolutely. I was on a plane uh, two or three weeks ago, <laughs> and the guy across the across the aisle goes, "Are you Andy Stump?" And I was like, <laughs> "I am." It is me. It was a big Cheshire cat grin on his yeah. face. He's like, "Are you Andy Stump?" I'm like, "Yes, I am." Yeah. He's like, "I love what you do, man." Save a bitch. <laughs> it was so funny. So I got on a plane the other day, and um. The flight attendant came up to me. He's wearing a uh, thin blue line flag on his lapel. And he comes up to me. He's like, Black Rifle Coffee? He's like, I am. It is like, true. I was a cop in, uh, I think it was in uh, uh, Michigan. He's like, I was a cop in Michigan for 20 years. It's my second job. Uh, and we were sitting there bullshitting. And then the pilot, he's like, goes and gets a pilot. The pilot comes out. The pilot's like, hey, what's up? It's the Navy, you know? And, like, <laughs> and, then, and then the stewardess comes out from the back. She's like, oh my God, I love Matt Best. You know? And I was like, yeah, of course. Right? So it's <laughs> of like, course yeah. No kidding. Of course, Boy, you yeah. know? You know? And, uh, but it was, it, it was so funny because there was like this 20-something flight attendant, the, uh, the female, the former police officer flight attendant, male that's like, 50 years old and all those people had heard of the company in one way or another, you know, one, obviously the female because of Matt's high cheekbones and his beautiful, his beautiful face and body. It's, right? voice it's hard to look uh, directly at him. It really is. It's like looking at Achilles. I mean, I want to look directly at him, yeah. but it hurts my eyes. It hurts. His features. What is it? The Fibonacci sequence? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's tough. It is. I want, there's a slight aura behind. It's like that, that bounce light right there. You're like, ah, 
I have to look away. I have to look away. I guess it's, it's a glance. It's periphery. Yeah. Yeah. It's a glance. No, it's everywhere. It's, um, you know, so Travis and Keese sell the coffee in the SBG gyms now in Missoula. Straight blast gym. Yep. In Missoula, Kalispell, My Fish, and people will come in just for the coffee. And then they've had people join like, hey, what's going on in here? They sell it at the uh, Cabela's in yeah, Kalispell. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I go in there. I mean, if I'm... Being totally honest, I'll go in there and I'll like hide the bag sometimes. Yeah, of course. But or just yeah. like hook them as far as I can or yeah. knock them over. That's what I do. I try to be as much of a problem for other people as right. possible. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, it's crazy how recognizable it is. Probably the most recognizable thing we were talking about this earlier, which you guys may want to look at restocking, is that tiger stripe sweatshirt. <laughs> that, Holy that thing shit. is crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've I've only worn it a couple times. You, you, you know where I first wore it was when we were whitetail hunting in Texas. Uh, that was what two years ago yeah. with yes, all was. those guys. Yeah, two, two springs ago. Uh, yeah, which was what happened this year. I don't know why. Did you guys get that invite or did we do something wrong? I think two we years did something ago? wrong. Yeah, we had to have. And then what's so? What's going on with you next, Trev? Um, well, I'm going to. South Carolina tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, for Winter Strong, for right? Winter Strong with uh, Bert Soren and awesome. the crew down there. Um, and then uh, more ice climbing to finish out the season uh, of cold tool hucking. Yeah. And where are you climbing here in Utah? Uh, yeah, actually. So there's climbing here in Provo Canyon, little cottonwood, big mm -hmm. cottonwood. The ice has been kind of crappy. Um, has was, Mark been going out with you or just no, you? No, yeah. I've been going out with other guys. And then I was, I just spent four days in Ure. Mm -hmm. over the ice festival. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was climbing some ice out there with a buddy of mine. And uh, I'll do some more up in Montana with Jeff. Uh, Shapiro. In spring. God, yeah. he's a fascinating human being. Jeff Shapiro is insanely good at ice climbing. I mean, he's been doing it for 25 years. Right. And so. bush piloting and, and rock piloting climbing and, and paragliding and parasailing and falconry yeah. and base jumping and skydiving. I'm going to be taking the mobile podcast rig up there and have yeah. a sit down talk with him but he's fascinating he's currently man. uh guiding paragliding in columbia yeah that sounds horrible it sounds yeah, like it he's wasted all his life terrible. Yeah. crazy yeah. shit huge like, waste of dude, they'll do like overlanding camping trips all in their paraglider like middle yeah. of nowhere just mm -hmm. self-supported and they're just launching and just going he and what a, he and oh yeah his, dude. uh two years ago now there's a movie out uh with it a documentary um the guy since passed away but he and uh that friend were the first two ever to Volbiv, which is what they call that, like traveling in a paraglider across the Brooks Range. Oh yeah, dude. But how do you, I guess I, I'm wondering what you hike what up. do you do? Okay, you gotcha. Hike, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fly. Yep. Thermal it up even higher. Fly farther. Got and then it. land when it. And then hike again, mm -hmm. do it again. Okay. Yeah, a lot like the, uh, the X-Alps. Right. Yeah. Okay. Or the X-Pier, those like racing competitions, mm -hmm. which he's competed in the X-Pier. Of course. Of course he has. Yeah. yeah. Damn you, Jeff. And are you going to do any more base jumping or are you... <sighs> I was talking about this recently. I met... Yeah. It yes -ish. Comes, it always comes up when you post yeah. pictures of your wingsuit. Well, I was looking through old <laughs> videos because, yeah. you know, the episode of Miles is in yeah. the can and he's talking about his favorite junk, jump, which is the low young frau. And I yeah. found a video of that exit just peeling over the field of joy. Oh, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic jump. And it's oh one God. of the coolest hikes in that valley. It's like gorgeous. two to three hours. Gorgeous yeah. the whole time. You know, there's cows running around with bells and shit. It's just like you're in, right. you, you know, you're looking for a waterfall you, of Swiss you take, chocolate. You, it's take, like, <laughs> you literally, you literally uh, take no so water beautiful. with you because there's because water coming everywhere. out of glaciers. Oh, Are you dude. kidding me? Oh, for real. Dude. No, this is no joke. It's, this actually, hike starts in the forest no and you crest out of it. And then it's, there's a, a farmer's house and like goats and you're on this grass path and you come underneath and you're walking just along the base of these cliff faces and there's just natural Springs. waterfalls coming out. You're just drinking you go underneath your exit point, you climb up, you take these chains and it's like this shale that can go. It's insane. It's like Lord of the Rings beauty in New Zealand. It's unbelievable. And then you don't have to walk down. You can take the express elevator. Right. Yeah. So it's nice. But so yeah. it sounds like there might be. Yeah, for sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's a little fun. Well, shit, guys, this has been awesome, man. Uh, that was Free Range American. I definitely appreciate everybody tuning in and listening. Uh, check out Coffee or Die. Check out Cleared Hot. And then yeah. look for Trevor's episode with uh, Shapiro, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. Come up. Cool. Thanks.